Hello everyone and welcome. This is Michael Conley, HP CareerNet, and today is the Coop Award winner series. So let me turn it over to Kelly. Kelly, would you like to introduce the wonderful people from Lincoln Industries? So uh, Link the Lincoln Industries Wellness Program has received as you know by the title of the C. Everett Coop National Health Award, but they've also received the American Heart Association Platinum Award and they've been featured in the Wall Street Journal and Forbes magazine. And today we have Greg Howe with us. He's a wellness manager at Lincoln Industries. His role as a wellness manager is to plan, develop, implement, manage, and evaluate the health and wellness of the organization. And his responsibilities include advising management and policy and program manner, matters, developing long-range goals and objectives, and billing and analyzing the return on investment of all programs. We also have Nikki Dugan. She is the Director of Business Development at Lincoln Industries. She focuses on evolving both internal and external market segments that will complete the operations and culture of Lincoln Industries. And prior to joining Lincoln Industries, she was the Director of Wellbeing Operations and Analytics at Healthways, a health and wellness company specializing in the total population health management. Her primary responsibilities included developing the well-being improvement strategies for organizations as well as leading research efforts for the Gallup Healthways Well-Being Index Program, which I believe we have a webinar coming up later in the year on. So go ahead and take it away, Greg and Nikki. All right, thanks, Kelly. All right, you guys, if you're ready to do it, it's all yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, so again, my name is Nikki Dugan. Uh, Greg and I are very excited to be with all of you today um, and tell you about the story of Lincoln Industries. Uh, Lincoln Industries is not an overnight success story. Uh, it has been a journey. The journey absolutely continues. Uh, we are constantly trying to figure out new and exciting ways to um, keep people motivated through culture and well-being initiatives. And we believe that in order to truly get people to their highest levels of performance and to their highest levels of well-being, you have to create the kind of culture that's conducive um, to them being able to do that. So over the next hour, we're going to tell you a little bit about our story, a little bit of our um, philosophical uh, background that got us to the point that we are today. But we're going to tell you some of the things that we do um, on a very tactical basis to get you hopefully to a place where you understand some things that can be done within, in your organizations to start transforming the culture um, and shaping your organization into the kind of place uh, that you want it to be. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we constantly notice nowadays when we look across uh, the business landscape. We see customers and suppliers. Um, we see continuous pressures on the supply chain. Uh, businesses are constantly facing economic conditions that make their relationships really strained on the supply chain side. At Lincoln Industries, we believe that that's a big opportunity to create and cultivate relationships that are conducive to weathering economic situations. On the operational side, we know that businesses in the U.S. lose over $73 billion, that's billion with a B, uh, dollars per year in lost work days and work performance due to health conditions and workplace injuries. Again, another opportunity, when we look at that, we say, how do we improve the well-being of our people? How do we get to a place internally where workers' comp is almost a non-issue and our people are healthy, happy, um, and productive while they're here? <clears throat> From the leadership side, we know that our leaders are having to do more with more with less. And like many businesses across the United States, leaders are trying to figure out how to improve performance without having to hire additional people. Again, under economic um, constraints, there are only so many people you can hire, so you really have to figure out how to maximize the value of your team. But how do you do that without putting additional stress and creating work-life balance issues and all of those components? Again, you know, workplace engagement, um, when you look at Gallup polling that they do around engagement, when you look at the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index, we know that perceptions of the work environment are kind of at an all-time low right now in the United States. Again, couple it with those economic factors that are happening in our country, um, but there's definitely a significant issue with engagement. A recent poll by ABC News and World Report showed that 70% of people working in your organization dream of having a different job. To us, again, that signifies an opportunity, and it's, it's a big challenge for companies out there to try to figure out how to engage people at the right places in your organization. We believe that that starts with your culture. 
<clears throat> on the workforce side. Healthcare costs. This is not uh, this is not anything new. This is the same thing that a lot of you have probably already heard and are probably experiencing in your organizations. Healthcare costs per employee are continuing to go up. There are no there's no end in sight. And businesses have got to figure out a way to mitigate healthcare costs. Um, that being said, I would say that, that that is almost an indirect product of our success. Um, when we first started out in the, in, in, on the path of creating the kind of culture and the kind of place where we wanted well-being to really thrive, uh, healthcare costs was not really our, our primary concern. It wasn't, that was not the, the number one goal. It happens to be a great byproduct of, of all of the things that we have done um, and therefore should not be uh, discounted by any means, but it should not be the primary goal. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, on that same token, as you look across all of the programs that are available out there, all of the things that you can do for your organization, many people are going to have challenges with their C-suite. So with their executives from the CEO all the way down, those executives, two out of three of them, are going to tell you that wellness programs are ineffective, and the reason that they're ineffective is primarily due to low engagement. And um, so businesses go out and they spend a bunch of money on wellness programs and then only, you know, on average, 20% or less are actually going to participate in those wellness programs, which makes it really difficult to justify and to get an ROI on those programs. Uh, we believe that, again, these, these initiatives should go beyond ROI, um, but also some of them, um, you know, there, there are different ways to increase and improve participation, and again, we believe that that begins with culture. And finally, <clears throat> this is the one that probably um, <laughs> scares me the most, 63%, almost two-thirds of the companies out there are not even measuring um, or are looking at ROIs associated with culture-based or wellness-based initiatives. So this kind of goes back to how do you know if it's even successful um, if the measurements are not out there. We have uh, several measurement tools that we use, and we'll kind of talk to you a little bit about all of them. But we believe that in order for culture and for well-being to truly take hold in your organization, you have to measure it. You have to understand what's working and what's not so that you can begin to reemphasize and place different emphasis um, on different areas where it's needed. So my, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, and you guys have, have probably heard this several times, that we believe that this business landscape and all of the, phase, the things that, that people are facing right now, insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We believe there's a different way to do it. We believe that organizations really can take hold of all of these components and make some pretty low-hanging fruit changes that in the end will pay off in huge dividends in terms of the performance of your organization. The way we look at culture and well-being and our operational um, metrics here at Lincoln Industries and our business landscape, we believe that it's similar to the pH balance of the human body. There is a very, very small window to get it right, but if you can figure out how to balance all of those components, you have a very high-functioning organization that, again, is going to lead to the best performance that you can possibly imagine. Why does culture matter? Um, you know, there, there are some people out there who believe that culture is a pretty fluffy thing and that it actually is, is not as important as operations. It, it, it might not be um, the highest ranking component of your organization. We don't necessarily think it should be a high, the highest ranking component, but we think it should be on a level playing field with operations. And again, if you think culture doesn't matter, take a look at the Saints. Um, this organization rewarded people for how they acted and how they performed on the field. Um, this is a very, very powerful differentiator. For the best of the best and the worst of the worst, culture is one of those key differentiators. When you look at performance and culture, and this is, again, another, it's a little bit of a fuzzy area for many people out there, um, including C-suite people. They see culture, and they, you know, they think we, we need a strong culture, but linking performance to culture can, can often be looked at kind of like Maslow's hierarchy. And um, the way that you set up your culture and the way that you fulfill people's needs in the workplace, and that's everything from materials and equipment and just the basics of how they do their job to how they really fit into your culture and are effective contributor or, or member of your organization, all the way up 
to people believing that they have a strong line of career progression. All of those things have a direct correlation to the metrics that you're going to hold near and dear to your hearts and your organizations, whether it's turnover or customer satisfaction, even things like loyalty and company pride that we know are directly correlated to engagement. All of these things go back to the bottom line. Um, and, and we believe are, are just critical in understanding what your organization looks like and how your organization can perform. So before I turn it over to Greg, um, Greg again is, is going to go into a lot more of the details of Lincoln Industries and all of the things that have been done over the past 20 years to get this culture and this organization to a place that it is now. Before I do that, I'd like to um, pop up this video. This is a piece that CNN, um, Sanjay Gupta, did um, on Lincoln Industries. And I hope that this will give you a good background and a good perspective as Greg goes in and talks a little bit more about his slides. No, I'm not sure why this is popping up. I apologize. Nikki, is it by chance available on uh, YouTube or some other public kind of place? You know what? Yes, it absolutely is. The long story short, this piece it is available on YouTube. You can look it up. Um, it's under CNN, Lincoln Industries Wellness. And Sanjay Gupta just kind of goes through um, what, the, what the things are, again, from a tactical perspective that Lincoln Industries really does to, to, to um, I guess, have their culture and have their well-being influence across their organization. Look it up on YouTube. I'm sorry that did not work, um, but definitely take a look at it on YouTube. And I will now turn it over to Greg to talk a little bit more um, about the Lincoln industry story. All right. right. Thank you, Nikki. Absolutely. So, yeah, sorry we couldn't get that video to work for you. It's just kind of nice to be able to uh, see a little, kind of see what Lincoln Industries actually looks like, some of the people. Uh, putting faces to the story is such an important part. Luckily, we've got some pretty good pictures here, so you'll get a little bit of that, just uh, not in the video form. So to start off, um, a little bit about who Lincoln Industries, who we are, uh, what we do, and who our people are, uh, most importantly. So founded in 1952, we're a privately owned company. Uh, it's a family business. Um, it was started by uh, the LeBaron family, and they still run it today. Um, we've had a consistent history of profitable growth. Um, we call ourselves more of a growth business almost than anything else. Um, we don't necessarily look at ourselves as uh, manufacturing. Um, our, we have consistent goals of 10 to 15 percent growth year over year, and we do that through uh, new technologies, new proce processes, and continuous improvement. Uh, we operate with uh, right around 500 people. Currently, we're at 550. It's a 24-7 operation. Uh, we run three shifts, but realistically, it feels like more like 20. Um, people are constantly coming and going in and out of the facility. Facility working with different uh, and within different departments. Uh, TS and ISO certified, and uh, we were we've been named great places to work uh, five years in a row. We were five years in a row, and we're hoping to get back on that list this year. What we do, um, we provide innovative solutions um, and exceptional service for, uh, for choice customers. Um, we do a lot of different things from plating to assembly, uh, polishing, coating. What that means is we work with customers like Harley Davidson. And um, everyone's familiar with Harley, I hope. Uh, and anything chrome on a Harley has, has come through Lincoln Industries. So we do a lot of plating solutions. Um, some of our other customers that you may recognize, Packard, Kenworth, uh, Peterbilt, the semi-trucks, John Deere. Um, so we work with a lot of uh, companies like that where we're uh, figuring out solutions for their, for their products, uh, both for cosmetics and, of course, for durability and function. When we look at our philosophy here at Lincoln Industries and how we set ourselves up um, to succeed as a business, these are the items that we look at, our, our foundational culture really starts with, with that and making sure that we build our entire business around culture. Fit, talent, and skill. This is our selection process. So as we go through selection, bringing new people into the organization, uh, we first look at fit, then talent, and then skill. Shared ownership. Although it's a privately held company, one owner, uh, single family, we want everyone to feel like they have ownership in the company. They're all stakeholders. And they all have a. They all. They all make a difference, um, and they're all part of the company. 
and then simplify the business. Communication is essential, and we want to make sure that every single person understands what we're trying to do and what goals we're, uh, we're reaching for. Um, on, with the goals, we want to make sure that those goals are set around measures that actually matter. There's a million different things that we can look at. Uh, we want to make sure that what we're measuring actually matters and is influencing the business so that we can move those metrics in the right direction. When we look back at the culture, we, we set that up with our beliefs and drivers. Our beliefs and drivers determine everything that goes on within the walls of Lincoln Industries and with even, even outside within the community um, and with our customers. Uh, when we look at the beliefs, this is the foundation of our culture. Uh, this really lets us build off of uh, anything that we do, we can build off these beliefs. And I'm not going to go through each one, but um, if you look at some of those, pretty typical of what you may see in other businesses, profitability, um, leadership. But wellness and healthy lifestyles are important to our success is, is rather unique. You won't, you won't find that in most businesses right there on their belief or mission or vision statement. And for us, that really puts wellness at the same level of importance as anything else. Um, and we can always come back to this, and we truly believe that wellness isn't important just to lower health care costs. Wellness is important to the success of our business. When we look at the drivers, uh, the drivers set us up for success as a business. And here we've got a couple that I want to focus in on. People development, uh, safe working environment, um, and then also environmental responsibility. So um, people development is absolutely essential, and wellness is part of that. We need people to uh, develop their wellness, their health, and make sure that they're productive, happy, um, people coming in day in, day out. So to simplify the business, we break it down into four pillars. And our four pillars, people, operational excellence, supply management, and growth. Using these four pillars, we can easily define the business for all levels of the organization, from our senior leadership down to somebody that's entered the business and uh, been here for a week, a month. Now, today we're going to focus a lot on the people side of it. Uh, that's where the wellness um, the wellness section falls. So when we look at key people issues, we're talking about wellness, selection or hiring practices, training and development, safety, communication, and culture. Um, they're all essential. And for our, for our culture to continue um, on the path that we want and for us to help guide the culture where we want it to go, we always have to keep these in front of us. Nikki mentioned 20-year uh, overnight success. So this is a little bit about the transformation of our organization and, and where we've gone. So um, we've got our business milestones and the wellness, well-being milestones here. So back in uh, 2000, uh, we uh, selected a wellness manager, and that really kick-started it into gear. We had always had committees going and um, focuses here and there, anything from walking programs to your, your basic education, lunch and learns. But when we brought on that wellness manager, it really, it really jump-started us to take it to the next level. Shortly after, um, we went into required health checks. And this is a, basically a biometric uh, check. So we go through blood pressure and things such as that. And that was required for all individuals. It wasn't optional. Um, we made every single person at Lincoln Industries go through that. And our CEO and president were the one, first ones through the door leading the way, really showing that leadership support. I'm going to talk a little bit later about our mountain climb. If you've heard about us before, um, you, I'm sure you've, you've heard the, the mountain climb mentioned. If, if this is the first time you've heard of Lincoln Industries, um, our mountain climb incentive is probably one of the most unique out there. But uh, for people that reach their highest wellness goals, uh, they get to attend a 14,000-foot mountain climb, which is pretty intense. And uh, with Nikki just joining Lincoln Industries, she's going to be attending her first one here this year. So I know she's ready for it. I am. I'm excited. <laughs> um, you know, our Coop Award, uh, we won here back in 2008. Uh, very excited about that. And from uh, since that Coop Award, we've just continued to make um, uh, new, new investments into our program and pushing the, pushing the envelope on where we're going to go. Um, most recently was our... Healthy You opening, and this was our on-site clinic, and we've seen amazing success. And 
On the bottom, I'm not going to go into the business milestones as much, but you can see that as we've continued our wellness journey, we've seen a lot of success in our business. And granted, they not might not be they might not all match up one to one, but we certainly see that as we've progressed along the wellness scale, our business has grown right along with it. So when we look at that philosophy around wellness, uh, it's all built on that foundational culture. It goes back to the beliefs and drivers. And as soon as you step foot in Lincoln Industries, you're going to hear beliefs, you're going to hear drivers from day one until um, the moment you retire. And as we build that foundational culture, it makes the healthy people part very, very, uh, well, I shouldn't say very, very easy, but it makes it easier um, to get people to that point. Um, we've got the culture, they understand it as soon as they walk into the door, and they've got the tools and resources to get there. Through that, we see optimal business performance, and ultimately what we have is we have healthy people that are engaged, they perform better, and they cost less. So as we move through this, we get into our measurable strategies um, and how we look at that. So measurement results are extremely important. I'm going to walk through a few of those today. Um, and how we use those to drive all levels of the organization. And we look at not just the operational metrics, not just the balance sheet, but the cultural metrics. And the cultural metrics um, are the ones that I'm going to talk about. So what is our, what's the health of our people? What's our turnover? Um, what do our surveys tell us about trust and engagement and job satisfaction? And with that, our leadership's leadership can really get engaged in that process of improvement, um, providing the tools for them, and making sure that they have the necessary results for their individual teams. And finally, we can break that down into individual success, and that's where we really see the growth take place. Um, we don't see it just at the individual, but um, because of the individuals that they work with day in and day out, um, they keep each other accountable, and they're all working towards uh, a lot of the same improvements. So here we've got a little bit about our savings. And on the left there, you've got the list of different ways that we calculate our return on investment and savings from, from our wellness and health programs. Um, you'll see turnover, absenteeism, uh, specific intervention programs around weight management and uh, um, chronic disease, smoking cessation, workers' compensation, uh, specifically related to musculoskeletal injuries, and then our health care costs. So um, on the right, ultimately you see a lot of that coming from the healthcare care costs, so we wanted to break that out a little bit there for you. And what you see is the orange bar is the Lincoln Industries cost per person, and then we look at it based on region size industry benchmarks to compare ourselves. So um, as you can see, we've had a general upward trend. However, we consistently stay about 30 to about 40 percent below um, our benchmarks. Um, in 2011, we actually dropped, and currently year-to-date in 2012, although it's not listed, um, we're trending um, right along with 2011 with zero increase right now and expecting that to continue through. So a little bit there about the uh, health care costs and um, how we measure our return from that. Here's our cost of avoidance and ROI. So. Um, on the left, looking at our cost avoidance, the dollars that we've saved, these are any items that we see without our wellness programs, without our intervention programs, um, costs we would have incurred otherwise, and then our return on investment. Um, one of the metrics that we measure every year is our ROI. Uh, this is something that we look at. Um, our general goal is four um, or better, and we've continued to see that. Um, and as I said, we saw that drop in 2011 on health care, and we continue to see it rise everywhere else, as we all know. Um, that trend goes up year over year. Um, with us holding it to a zero trend this year would be a very big win and uh, really help that return on investment. Turnover, um, extremely important here. The longer that we, um, and we have actually done some research on this, you can, um, you can look at the article that was published in the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine um, last year in April. And what we saw is people that are here at Lincoln Industries longer um, are, are uh, low and moderate risk, had zero trend, and our high risk actually were reducing risk factors. So 
that turnover is extremely important. If we can keep that turnover low and we keep our people here, we know that the programs and intervention, uh, uh, interventions that we have in place are going to keep those people healthy and reduce risks. When we look at well-being results, um, as a total well-being, so looking at more than just the physical health, uh, we have used the Healthways Well-Being Assessment, and that's what you're seeing there on the right, our well-being assessment results. So at uh, national, we look at the state, we broke it down into the city, and then Lincoln industry specifically. So what's really neat is if you kind of graph this out, you have this nice bright green dot where Lincoln industry sits on the map. And then everything else around it would be uh, uh, more of a shade of orange or red. And so we know that what we're doing has a huge impact um, on our people because no matter where they live in the community um, and what other ac whatever access they have to healthy foods, um, to physicians, to dentists, um, to safe neighborhoods, what we do within our walls has an impact. Um, and we, we see that come through in leadership engagement and people involvement. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the leadership engagement because that's really where it all starts. And we always say walk the talk. That's a pretty common quote that we use around here. If you're a leader within this company, um, it's not optional uh, to, be, to, to be involved with the wellness programs. and to, That's not an option of, of leading your people. That's part of the game. Um, it's a responsibility that comes with being a leader within the company. Uh, one of my favorite is our senior team workouts, the first Monday of every month. Um, I take all of our VPs and presidents through a, through a different workout. Sometimes I uh, go easy on them and we do a nice hike. Other times I get to run them through a boot camp or a pretty brutal spin class. Um, good way to just get them out there in front of it, leading and keeping it as a focus. And then um, our three for three, this is a leadership metric. Um, we look at three things for all leadership. One, the success of their department or the success of their group that they work with. Two, the leadership development of their people and the personal development. And then three, wellness development for their people. So the, it's, it's a quick way we can look at all leaders across the company to see if they're meeting expectations. And then, of course, we have an all-company wellness metric. Uh, this is communicated monthly to the entire company on how we're doing. The people involvement side, I'm not going to go through uh, each bullet point here, but these are just the different programs that are ongoing to keep our people involved um, daily, weekly, monthly um, in different campaigns that we offer, um, different intervention programs, and ultimately just giving them the resources and tools they need to be successful. So again, it comes back to that accountability formula. Um, using that leadership engagement model, um, we can understand what our leaders need to be successful, and then they can work with their individuals to drive that success. So one way that we do this is through our performance objectives. Um, during the performance objective, uh, we're actually just getting ready to start that up here. As we start our performance objective process, and people are developing their, their team objectives, um, their individual objectives related specifically to their job, and then their personal development objectives. Part of that personal development objective includes wellness. So 100% of the people here at Lincoln Industries have some sort of wellness objective um, that directly relates back to their annual merit increase. And right here, this makes it relevant to every single person across the organization. And what's special about this is I'm not out there telling each person, OK, you need to exercise you know, this many times a week, or you need to focus on you know, making sure you're eating enough fruits and vegetables. It's what's relevant to the individual. So if we've got someone advanced and maybe they've been training for a marathon, that's what's going on their objective is to complete that marathon by the end of the year. Maybe if it's someone who they're not necessarily looking for to really engage in that physical piece, they've been, they're maintaining and they're happy with where they're at, maybe they're focusing on something like work-life balance and making sure that they're eating, you know, a family dinner four nights a week. Um, it really revolves around that well-being model and making sure that it isn't just an objective for the sake of having an objective, but that it's mattering to that in, that it matters to that individual. So when we when we look at all this from the the metrics to some of the programs um, 
and how it actually affects the, the, the success of the company, it's important not to forget about the real reasons that, that we're doing this and, and why we're taking so much time and effort and why you're sitting on this call today um, learning about what you can bring back to your organization. These are the real reasons. This is what I wake up you know, and every day to, to come to work and do. And um, A couple stories. Um, Seth was somebody who has been here at the company for over 10 years. Um, and for, the, for a long time, he, he was really lacking in the wellness and health area. Um, a few years back ago, he joined Weight Watchers, lost over 100 pounds within one year. Um, he's now one of our wellness champions who's summited three 14ers. Uh, finished a marathon, and then finished an ultra marathon, which was 50 miles. Um, so pretty intense, uh, and has just been a great role model for so many other people. Um, one of the neat things is when Seth started this, uh, he was a leader within the company, but over a very small area. Um, since he's made this improvement in his, in his own personal health, um, he's seen his performance improve and he's now responsible for a much larger area across the organization that has uh, significant growth potential um, that he's been leading. John um, is another great story that we have here. John, 55 years old when he started his, his wellness journey, he'd been smoking for over 20 years, finally decided it was time to quit smoking, used some of the resources and tools that we had in place here lost over 75 pounds through quitting smoking, changing his diet, and starting to exercise. Completed his second half marathon this year, and he's also uh, finishing his college degree right now. So just an amazing feat for him to come back to school after all that time to finish his degree. And John just has a contagious attitude about health and wellness. Um, you'll be walking through the plant, and you'll see him, and he comes up, gives you a big handshake, and you know can't, be, can't wait to talk to you about what his next event is that he's run in, or what's the next wellness program that we're going to be offering. So just this contagious attitude spreads through the organization, through the people that he works with on a daily basis, and it has a large, large impact on the whole success of wellness across the organization. Incentives are certainly an important part, um, and we, we uh, definitely leverage these to motivate people. Um, we certainly want a lot of that personal motivation to be there, and we want that intrinsic motivation um, to really be the driver, but it never hurts to put some uh, carrots out in front of people. And so the Go Platinum 14,000-foot mountain climb was something we developed back in 2004. And for all the people that reach their wellness goals, they earn points throughout the year, and they move from bronze to silver to gold all the way up to platinum. And anyone that reached platinum is invited on this all-expense-paid trip, and they come out to Colorado, and they're summoning a 14,000-foot mountain um, right next to the president, the owner of our company. And it's just a very, very powerful um, incentive. We've had people that have never even been to Colorado, and we bring them out there, and for the first time they see the mountains, and a day later we're putting them on top of them. And that's something that they don't forget, you know. We can give them, you know, a cash prize or, um, you know, a neat incentive, and it they'll feel good about it for a day, two days, maybe a month, who knows. But when you put somebody on the top of a mountain and they feel that accomplishment, that's something they never forget, and the power that comes with that's just, um, it's amazing. They come back to the company after the trip, and they're talking with their coworkers on the experience and, and what it felt like to achieve that. And, um, it's just something very unique that, um, has really helped accelerate uh, the success of our program. We do have outcomes-based incentives as well. We have some links directly to our health insurance. Uh, we focus on metabolic syndrome risk factors. So um, each year people test and go through this, and that, uh, that determines their premium um, that they pay each month. And then we also have some uh, HRA contributions as well. So it's, both a, it's a mix of outcomes and participation-based incentives. And so that's kind of the Lincoln industry story. I gave you a, a little bit of a, a peek inside of what we do, some of the programs, and how it works. And I'm going to turn it back over to Nikki here to kind of talk about how to replicate this and scale it across to uh, your organization. Thank you, Greg. 
You know, one of the things that is the last thing that Greg touched on, you know, that, that always amazes me, I've worked with many, many organizations from Fortune 100 to small and mid-sized employers, and, and one of the things that just consistently amazes me is how much they have gotten people to move um, here at Lincoln Industries, how much they have motivated people um, by the mountain climb. Incentives is one of those is, is one of those areas that um, organizations have tried a bunch of different things. Um, and sometimes we overcomplicate the incentive side. Um, sometimes it's so complicated that it takes more to track it um, and to figure out, you know, how to how to do all of it and how to operationalize all of it than it's actually worth. And sometimes it can be a lot more simplified if you know your organization and know your people uh, well enough to know what's going to motivate them. In terms of, of that pH balance that we were talking about, this is kind of a graphic that shows what we, what we think of at Lincoln Industries when we think of pH balance. Um, the biggest component of pH that we believe has to, has to be there in order for your organization to see this kind of success is the balance of operational and cultural metrics. And we've alluded to that a few times during this presentation and just can't say enough about it. Uh, when, the, when the executive team, when the leadership of this organization gets together and talks about operational measures, well, whether it's you know, getting together at the end of the month and talking about um, EBITDA, net income, revenue trends, anything that you want to think of on the operational side, um, they also have discussions about culture. Where are we on this initiative? Where are we on our scores? Uh, there, is, there is a clear and pointed effort to make sure that the cultural metrics are just as much in front of people as the operational metrics. And our president will tell you he is just as nervous to see annual results and to see how the year finally shaped up as he is to see the annual result of the Great Places to Work or of the Individual Opinion Survey. Um, those things matter just as much to him because it is truly a reflection on leadership, a reflection on how engaged people are, and at the end of the day, it's a leading indicator as to whether or not those operational metrics are going to be met. So our, our, I think our primary piece of advice um, as, as you start thinking through how this looks in your organization is to make sure that that C-suite, that the top level of your organization can get on board and can, can begin to wrap their minds around what that would look like to have cultural metrics and operational metrics on the same level playing field as you look at strategic roadmap design, as you take in all of those factors. I know many companies who, whether it's their industry or their demographics or their location, those things these companies see as barriers. And they say, oh, well, I, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I'm a manufacturing company, and we typically don't have high well-being, and our socioeconomics aren't great. All of those things can be overcome. We know that culture, we know that well-being, we know that there are, there are things that you can do as an organization to really just, to, to just bust right through any kind of barriers on the demographic or socioeconomic side. And that's one of the coolest things about this stuff. It can be done in any organization, anywhere, in any industry, with any group of people. If you don't believe that, look at Lincoln Industries. You know, their average age is about 42. Their average annual household income is about $36,000 a year. They're 82% male. They are in the Midwest where meat and potatoes are king. Um, and they have been able to see tremendous results um, in, in well-being and in culture. As, as we look through the business and as we look through our strategy, we kind of look at, at nine different areas. We call them levers. And we think of them as levers that we can pull within the organization um, to continue to, to optimize business performance and to continue to get our culture, our well-being, our operations kind of all in tune and in that pH balance that we're talking about. This is everything. I mean, this is everything from finding organizational purpose and making sure that that purpose aligns with your individual's purpose somehow. Uh, we work with a company out in San Diego, and they do a lot of uh, debt collection. And they said, you know, how are we ever going to get an organizational purpose that aligns with our individual purpose? We're, we're basically, you know, collectors. We, we call people and hound them to pay credit card bills. And, you know, we thought about it, and we said, well, you know, it, it, that is true. But on the flip side, you guys are also doing a lot to help people get out from under debt. 
it, yes, it's not the most glamorous business in the world, but what they do at the core of their business can be turned into something very meaningful that people can relate to. And at the end of the day, they're not sludging into work saying, oh, I've got to call more people and hound them. And instead, they're saying, you know, every person I call today, I can make a difference in their life. I can get them out of debt. I can help them start a new life, and that sounds very, very different. Organizational purpose, again, it's one of those things that doesn't have to be overcomplicated. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to have a, a big fancy purpose. It just needs to be something that your people can relate with, and it is one of your biggest engagement tools. Effective people selection. This is another one where people, you know, a, a lot of people still focus on resumes and still focus on skills when they hire people. We believe that skills can be learned. We believe that talent and fit in the organization, as Greg said, are much more important than the actual skills that people have on their resume. Um, from benefits and understanding how to sustain engagement in your organization, looking at leadership development, leadership accountability, getting those metrics so that leaders know what's expected of them. They know that once a month on Mondays, Greg is going to get them out and work them out at boot camp and, you know, until they drop, and that's a part of being a leader at this organization. Looking at colleague well-being, even looking at customer and supplier collaboration, this is one of those areas. We didn't touch a whole bunch on this area, but this one's this one's key. The way you treat your people internally, the way that you, the way that your culture is set up, the way that your beliefs and drivers function within your organization bleed through your supply chain, and they make a big, big difference. From suppliers who are willing to go the extra mile to maybe get you some parts that you know you you need overnight just because they know what a good organization you are and you, they know that you're not going to slash their prices because you value them as part of your supply chain. To customers who know that you are going to you know you're going to do whatever it takes to get product to them and you do it in a way where people are happy, engaged, and always doing their best. Supply chain is a huge component of this, and all of those, all of the things that we talk about when we talk about balance, go straight to the supply chain, and therefore straight to the bottom line. I mean, again, on measurement, we can't say enough about this. Um, looking at a measurement that is going to get you to a place where you understand how your leadership is perceived. You understand how your culture is driven, and what people think of your culture, and you understand your outcomes. We think that those are the three primary areas, leadership, culture, outcomes. Um, you know, outcomes can be measured through HRAs. If you want to go more broad, you can look at well-being measurement. But at the end of the day, you've got to be able to see those outcomes. And it's helpful to see how all of the other components relate to one another when you're looking at the outcomes. So when you look at your organization, you see, oh, 40% of my people have high cholesterol, 30% have high blood pressure, and you see all of those HRA outcomes, wouldn't it be nice to know what's driving them and what, what, what you can really do to start moving those? Knowing those numbers is important, but also knowing that people don't feel like they have a work-life balance or, you know, people feel like they're, you know, they, they don't have the opportunity to expand their social network and there are things that can be done there, or they're worried about financial concerns and maybe you can put programs in place to start helping them with that. There's so many areas that you can look at, but you first kind of got to get the drivers behind the outcomes in order to understand where to start placing your time and your efforts. You know, at the end of the day, when this is all said and done, looking at the value of all of the things that we've been talking about, looking at how establishing a balance in your organization of culture and operations, we really, I mean, it, it, it really just pays endless dividends. It's going to be something that your organization will really take and just thrive on in all areas. So starting with the foundational things. Starting with leadership, again, getting your leaders engaged, accountable, and getting them un to understand what your metrics look like, not only from the operational side, but from the culture side. And then working your way up the pyramid, looking at foundational culture. What do you want your culture to be in your organization? Do you have a culture right now? And if so, are you happy with it? Do you, you know, think it needs to be improved upon? Whatever that looks like, really establishing that foundation, foundational culture. We think that without that foundational culture, you can invest all you want to in trying to get people's well-being to improve or their health to improve. And at the end of the day, you're going to get back to that statistics that statistic that we showed you on the first slide. 
less than 20% of your people are going to engage, and in general, your leaders are going to think it's ineffective, unless that sound foundational culture is there. Moving all the way through to well-being, to customer suppliers, and then wrapping it all up in a pretty little package with a bow and that measurement so that you can continually and ruthlessly measure it and understand what the ROIs are, what the outcomes are, what all of those components are. Those are the foundational things. And then from there, you know, you, you really start to see the transformation that leads to optimal business performance. And optimal business performance means so many different things. It's things, it's all of those metrics that you hold near and dear to your heart, from, you know, reducing healthcare costs to reducing turnover, um, improving your engagement, looking at productivity, both in terms of absenteeism and presenteeism and how to pull the levers on those things, lowering workers' comp, one of the things that um, Lincoln Industries, you know, about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, took their workers' comp costs from $500,000 a year to under $50,000 a year. How they do that? Simple things. They put in little safety programs, things like stretching um, before people go out on the line. Basic, they got back to the basics, and they saw huge dividends in that. They've measured it, they've continued to improve it, and their workers' comp costs have not gotten as high as they were since then. So at the end of the day, um, we hope that you have that you've taken something away from this, and that you see that you see the the value of doing these things. Again, many people believe that operationalizing it can become a very difficult thing. Um, in, in many organizations, but hopefully we've given you some tools and we've given you some best practices and some ideas um, around how to truly bring pH to your organization. And with that, I think we will open it up for questions. Great, Nikki and Greg, you, uh, you did an awesome job. Um, we do have some questions. So Wonderful. let's see. Yeah. So let's see here. Um, you talked about hiring people uh, who fit. Um, can you give us some examples of how you do that, you know, some sort of uh, how your hiring practices or procedures might differ from somebody who's just looking at a paper resume? Sure. So, yeah, when we look at our selection process, it goes through th very three very distinct um, three, three very distinct areas. So the first one's fit. So this is just general questions. Uh, about just about the people um, and ultimately what we're looking for is do they fit with our company culture do their beliefs line up with our beliefs um, do their areas of talent um, meet what they want to do within the organization mm -hmm. and then finally the skill do they have the experience um, is it a position that needs uh, certain education. So that's how it follows through. That talent process um, is very specific. So uh, we, based on the jobs, certain talents are required. Sure. And if that talent doesn't line up, if, if that's not something you naturally have, long term that's not going to be uh, a good fit in that position. You might be able to do that, but it's going to be a struggle. It's not going to come natural to you. And ultimately what we're going to do, it's, it's not going to be good for that individual or the company because they're going to get tired of what they're doing um, and they're going to want to find a new position or find a new company. And as a company, we're going to have to replace that position. And I will tack on one thing on that. I, I, the president, Hank Worm, and I always, always joke back and forth about this. He always says, would you spend eight hours riding in a car with that person? Like that is his primary oh. way of seeing whether or not somebody fits. And I always joke with him and say, Hank, I wouldn't even do that with my own husband. So I don't know if that works for everybody, but that's, that's Hank's, you know, big thing around fit. Well, that, that's a pretty good um, yardstick, I think. That's right. <laughs> And we do have quite a few specific measurement tools that we use to judge that. It's not just kind of this fluffy in the air uh, sort of thing, but very specific questions that we put a lot of research and, and time and effort in to develop. Okay, super. Um, let's see. Another question. Doug would like to know, um, have you integrated wellness directly into safety? And if so, uh, can you give some examples? Yeah, so the... We, we have some levels. Uh, we're still working through that, and that's actually a pretty big objective for the next two years um, to continue that 
The most basic one is our safety program, or excuse me, our stretching program. So Nikki mentioned it uh, very briefly, but before every shift, uh, every single day, um, all people, whether you work on the line or in the office, go through a stretch program. And it's specifically designed around uh, where you work. So if you're doing a lot of extra gripping, pinching, um, we'll focus on the, the hands, we'll focus on the forearms, the shoulders. If you're doing a lot of uh, moving large boxes or heavier machinery, um, we'll focus more on back stretches and things such as that. So um, that one we've had in place for quite a while. Uh, one of the other items that we do, um, it started out of the wellness set side of things, and since we've kind of moved it over into safety, um, but it's our massage therapy program. And we offer massage therapy here to uh, all, of our, all of our technical people. And it's on the clock, company paid, uh, massage therapy that focuses on specific muscles of the body, um, again, based on where they work and the risk levels associated with that position. I was just thinking, uh, you know, I might just send you my resume. No, just <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're growing, so we're looking for resumes. Uh, I'm just kidding. Anyway, uh, more questions. <laughs> Kathy would like to know, she said, I would love to have a quote from the owner as to why he decided to incorporate employee wellness into the organization and dedicate resources to do so. <laughs> I love it because he's got this quote, and I, I actually used it on our COOP application when we won back in 2008. And I don't, it might not be exact, but basically um, healthy and happy people make for a better work environment. And it was as simple as that. He, he's just always had um, just a natural sense that it makes sense. And why wouldn't we do it? Why wouldn't we put resources towards it? And as we continue to show results, he continues to uh, uh, support and, and ultimately invest in it. Uh, he puts his money where his mouth is. That's one of my favorite things, and we, we mentioned this earlier in the webinar, it was never a question of, you know, healthcare costs are out of control and we need to do something, so let's do well-being. Um, you know, this, this happened way, way before that was really even, healthcare costs were really even being looked at, and that was really even an issue. It was just more, you know, Mark is, Mark is a very active guy, very physically fit. He, you know, he knew that when he was fit, and when he had higher well-being, he felt better. He wanted to do more. He wanted to, you know, be more. And he really wanted that for everybody else. He said, I, I, hope, I want everybody to feel this way and to experience, like Greg said, the, the happiness that comes along with health and well-being. So that was, really, that was really where it started. It was never about saving money or really productivity even. It was just mm -hmm. wanting people to have better lives. Nice. Uh, let's see, here's another question. Um, what do you see as the biggest threat to uh, Lincoln Industries' continuing success? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> a lot of it is our growth mentality. Um, our biggest threat will be continuing to find uh, new growth initiatives uh, to continue our company. That's, that's one of the reasons that we're able to kind of push the envelope with our wellness program because as we grow operationally as a company, we grow our culture right along with it. Um, and sometimes we'll grow our culture before the operation side as well. Uh, so I would say we have to continue to be an innovative company, not just in our operations, but our culture. Um, so we have to look, uh, when we look at that culture side, we start to break it down into more of a human capital type metric. Mm. And Lincoln, Nebraska, is, it's a tougher place to grow just because of the size of the city um, and bringing in the, the right fit and the right talent. Mm. Did, did you say how big is Lincoln, Nebraska? Lincoln, Nebraska is about 250,000. It's a pretty big college town. Uh, yeah, I can see that's, uh, that's not a giant town now. <laughs> No, no, it's it's really not, and it's much smaller in the summer. Mm, I'll bet. <laughs> I bigger won a football game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's funny. Nikki 
mention football. We're in Lincoln, so I, I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't mention the Huskers. A little bit about Nebraska. On Husker game day, uh, Memorial Stadium is the uh, third largest populated area in the state. So. <laughs> That's I <great>. love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess um, one more question because we're just about yeah. out of time. So what's, um, you know, what's, what's next? What's, what, uh, what's on the horizon for you guys? Anything, you know, uh, like you were talking about, I think safety is... Uh, one of the things you want to more tightly integrate with. What else? Yeah, so I would say the other, the other big item is really moving not away from wellness for healthcare, but ultimately that wellness for performance. And we know it's already there. Now we're just figuring out how to measure it. Um, mm -hmm. We're figuring out how we can impact it more. And it kind of goes back to that human capital metric, you know. We look at that return on investment very closely. Um, and we use pr pretty hard dollar figures for that, but we know there's so much more out there with productivity, presenteeism um, that we can measure. So we continue to work on that and uh, expand our level of knowledge and our programs to uh, to improve productivity across the across the company. Well, thank you all for having us. We have we've enjoyed being here, and and if you have any questions, uh, please please feel free to get a hold of us. <laughs>